I think we're all familiar with her ambitious uh, system-wide strategic plan, the power of SUNY. Um, and it really has touched all of us. Uh, we've seen improvements on our campuses um, and in education really all along the pipeline, which is a, a big part of the message. We've got increased enrollments and synergies uh, among our campuses, new links to industry. Um, and of course, we've all been um, encouraged to build those bridges um, to our local communities. I think the result of all of that really has been to raise the national and the international uh, image of SUNY, which is, um, I think, to all of our benefits. So I think the other message that we hear a lot from uh, the chancellor is uh, the impact of education on the economy. Um, and like you, she's been constantly, consistently aware of the impact on the economy the, of the um, impact of the arts and how that really does drive the economic engine. So she's here this morning to recognize all of your good work and I'm not going to take any further time away from her agenda with you. Uh, please join me in welcoming Chancellor Nancy Zimpar. And it is. Uh, but I want to say while you're still here that um, just to be a part of the Fashion Institute of Technology is a great privilege for me. Um, what should I say? I like to shop. Maybe that, maybe that would be a fair way to introduce myself into this uh, wonderful establishment. But uh, it is such a privilege to really go around the country and around the world and when the Fashion Institute comes uh, when someone voices some uh, affiliation to say what, how proud we are that FIT is a member of the State University of New York. And um, I happen to be in Korea, in Seoul, Korea, and there's an international campus there, and our campus at Stony Brook, someone here must be from Stony Brook, um, has, uh, <laughs> yay, uh, participates. It's one of only five campuses from around the world that is situated in Seoul, Korea at this global campus. And I'm not kidding you, the first thing uh, above and beyond Stony Brook's presence there, when we talked about what other institutions might uh, from the SUNY system come to this campus, there was a man there who does uh, visual uh, imaging of yourself and then fits clothing to that image. This is cutting edge technology, right? It's a little disappointing for me because I still want to go into a store and try it on and say this doesn't fit. But um, that's exactly what he did and he made me a golf glove by scanning my hand in his little machine and then creating this personalized golf glove. And all he wanted to do was partner up with FIT and that's halfway around the world. So thank you, Joyce, for your leadership, and thanks for coming today and for hosting us. So take care. OK, all righty. Um, I uh, am going to relinquish this for the moment uh, and go to the podium only because I have a few notes that will make life go better than if I don't read them. Um, Jen LaTurco is here, and she knows that um, sometimes I do totally forget to say what I meant to say. So I'm going to really make an effort at it today. Um, I just want to thank you. Um, I did, um, years ago, try to uh, get, a, get a handle on how many, if you would call them roll-alike groups, we have in the State University of New York. Um, that is to say, where you convene amongst like colleagues for a coordinated purpose in your work at the State University of New York. And so I thought we had about 20 of these groups. And I mean by that, our, our provost get together and our chief financial officers and our information officers. And I had picked up another meeting with our fundraisers and friend developers. We have, what, Jen, 160 plus of these roll-alike groups in SUNY. 
all, I think, rowing in the same direction, but all taking time to both be with your institution, be with the system, but be with yourself. So I have a pretty good grip on what it means to get together and share experiences and, and learn from each other, and I congratulate you for that. Uh, I do know that as art department chairs, your organization is about 40 years old, but the newer of the group is gallery directors and exhibit directors, and so I think it's a, a really cool thing that you are together and that you're meeting together and that you would invite me to the club. So um, first of all, I need to say we're in the middle of the budget season. Nothing is safe. If you feel a little insecure today, it's because the legislature is in session and they are debating our budget. And you are hearing and reading sort of the consequences of this debate. Uh, it's early yet. It's only March 18th and the budget is not concluded until the end of the month. So we have two really big weeks. So if you read something, that you don't like, just wait till tomorrow and you'll read something else that you don't like. But I can't tell you how hard those people called government relations people on your campuses are working right now to give us the benefit of whatever the state can invest in the State University of New York going forward. You're also reading a lot about CUNY. Uh, if you're picking up the clips. And the governor's gotten very interested in CUNY lately and interested in the relationship between CUNY, CUNY and SUNY, particularly our back office function. So you might be reading a little bit about that. But in between long days uh, at the Capitol building, I've also been traveling in behalf of the State University of New York. and. Um, Two or three days ago, because I've lost track of even what today is, I was at a session sponsored by the Gates Foundation, and they were really trying to help presidents at that meeting and chancellors look forward. They even had a futurist organization called the Institute for the Future. Did you know we have a Palo Alto, where, where better to place it, Institute for the Future. And they were really wowing us with things that will be important to our future. Now, the byline was, I'm glad to be a member of your club. How could I profess to have a credential that would align me personally with you? Well, here's the deal. Instead of degrees and diplomas and even micro-credentials, there is now a new online initiative that allows you to record every learning bit that you have accrued over your life into a mosaic of your education DNA. That's the way I would say it. So you can enter like on your resume, the degrees you've received. But you can also give a little, like a bubble, for a workshop you've attended, uh, for something you've written, uh, for some skill that you've acquired. So that over time, for each of us, we will have this educational record that will be much more dynamic than what I put on my resume, which is my degrees. And I've never really thought seriously about the kind of seminars I've attended and things that I've advanced that would make up a more graphic uh, picture of my educational DNA. I kind of hope we live beyond this, but it, it is what's coming, and that's what we were there for. So I was trying to create my digital arts credential. That's where I'm going with this. Oh, and I'll get past it, and you'll be glad. But um, first of all, I'm an English major. And in the arts and humanities, that counts. I'll come back to that, too. But when I was very young and a member of the 4-H, because I grew up in a very rural area, I made towels. 
they call them huck towels, and I know there's not a single person in this room who has any idea what that is, but you could display them at the state fair, and you got ribbons for making really good huck towels. When I was a little older, I sewed, and I had no idea at the time, uh, I sewed with my mother, that she was using only Vogue patterns. For some of you in the room, that really matters. She wasn't using Butterick, she wasn't using some other, but the designer patterns were Vogue. I learned to quilt by living next door to a woman who was an expert quilter. And over the course of 25 years, I actually completed one quilt. It's the bear's paw quilt, and if you have a quilting book, you can find that pattern, because the quilting patterns are historically very, very important. Along the way, someone gave me a baritone ukulele. That's not a uke. That's the first four strings of a guitar. There must be someone in the room who knows that. And that led to my lessons in guitar, and ultimately, since I taught in the Ozarks, my own personal dulcimer. So I'm a quilter. I'm a sewer, a seamstress. Um, I'm a guitar player. I now have an amplifier and a really important guitar, and I haven't had it out of the box since I came to SUNY. Thank you very much. <laughs> I um, thought that the best way to stay sane while I was getting my doctorate was to take watercolor lessons. And so for the last 40 years, I can't believe it, I've been painting, so much so that the University Club in Albany agreed or asked me to exhibit, Joe, this is just shocking, uh, my watercolors. I had to ask my family to give me back some of the things I had given them. They're, in my view, were at best amateur, low amateur, but I think if I were painting my artistic or arts and humanities DNA, I would begin to build a portrait like you can, of all the things that were inspiring to me about my work in the arts and how fundamental my relationship with the arts and humanities has been to my world view. So if I were applying to be in your club, that would be the case I would make. But lo and behold, I'm the chancellor of the State University of New York, and I am in the beginning of my eighth year. I was hired in February of 2009. We were in a terrible place financially, if you will recall. And uh, I believed that there could be no higher calling for the State University of New York than to help New York get back on its feet. That is the single explanation for how we over the next 10 months of my beginning tenure, actually crafted a message to the state of New York that SUNY could be its economic engine. I can't tell you how many faculty senate meetings I have been to where that point of view has been challenged. I do accept that. I understand that our vision of SUNY as an economic engine seemed too commercial and too crass for higher learning, but I never dichotomized our role of offering education to enlighten the citizenry of New York from our ability to help New York get back on its feet. But the context is very important because for some of you who are as mature as I am, you might have even been in these conversations where we attempted to talk about economic revitalization in many, many ways. And I am very proud to say that of the six ways we thought we could contribute to New York's revitalization beyond our commitment to health and welfare, our commitment to education, our commitment to environmental issues, was our commitment to engaging with our communities. We called it SUNY and the Vibrant Community. And it set us down a path where we began to lift up our commitment to the arts. Um, and, and a lot has happened to build on that commitment, and I'll speak to that in a minute. But in a 
in our effort to put SUNY forward, we begin to break down these big ideas into actions and activities. And I really think that uh, we're still in the very nascent stages of what it means to have SUNY really pay attention to the vibrant community. And that's an area where I think we still have a lot of work to do. Um, I'm thinking back over these national conferences we've been holding here in New York. We've had about five of them. We're getting ready to have our sixth, and they've been about economic development. They've been about systems and how systems work. They've been about big data. Uh, they've been about uh, a new business model for higher education. But I would implore you that a cutting edge way to talk about the arts in our life might one day be the universal theme of one of these conferences. Uh, because we plan ahead, we, we've we already started talking about the October 2016 conference. But if you want to think about a product that could come from these two organizations working together, it might be that in 2017, you could co-sponsor this national conference. But it can't just be a conference on arts and the humanities or the importance of them, you have to go to the very edge of your work and think uh, about uh, maybe the digital arts credential, something like what I was trying to mimic in what I've learned about how we're going to think about education and documenting and credentialing our work. Wouldn't it be interesting if we had a whole conversation about credentialing the arts and humanities in your life. I will tell you, though, in every one of these five conferences, when we talk about a topic, it seems always to come back to the arts and humanities. Even when we were talking about the workforce and building a new business model for higher education, Everybody wanted to say that when they went to college, they were not a business major. They were not a coder. They were not in, in IT or, or information sciences. They were in philosophy or history or political science or English or the arts, just how the humanities keep coming back to our worldview. So you are living in a system that's still advocating its role in the revitalization of New York. And I think we've understated what that means in uh, embedding in everyone's life a, a cultural dimension. And I said I'd come back to this. In SUNY and the vibrant community, which is one of the six big ideas of the power of SUNY, which is still in place today, we had an idea that we were going to create a virtual arts app. And that app, we were working with the New York State Council of the Arts. That app would, uh, and Tracy and others can help me out here, but the vision of that idea was that any student, any SUNY student could go to that app and use it to visit any one of your arts installations, galleries, workshops, exhibits, performances, you get the picture? This is the most exciting idea on the planet. And it fell apart. Only because that kind of an idea takes constant attention. And if you guys wanted to dig it out and revitalize it, nothing would make me, us, happier. It's a really cool idea. And we could take it from SUNY students to CUNY students, to all the students of the independent colleges across New York, of which there are like a 1,000, we could spread this across the citizenry of the state of New York. And I don't think there's another place on the planet that does this. But I'm just saying there's still time to insert yourselves into this commitment of SUNY and the vibrant community, and that app still needs to be done and could be embraced by you all in this format. So I, I really tried to think contextually about where we're going as, as a system. And 
in addition to maintaining our commitment to the revitalization of New York, because it is still very necessary, and maintaining our public national voice through these conferences, we are, as many of you may know, uh, in a new phase of life at SUNY where we have a performance management system called SUNY Excels. And each of your campuses has submitted um, a plan for your own commitment to student access, student completion, student success, inquiry across our campuses, and engagement. So those five buckets are how we are going to measure our impact at SUNY, our impact in the state, our impact nationally and internationally. What are we doing to provide more access for students on our campuses? What are we doing to make sure our students complete? I would have said a degree, but now I have to say a micro-credential, a competency, a bubble. I don't know what to say. The world is changing faster than I can even get my arms around it. But completion can be defined very broadly, and the burden will be on us as campuses to make sure each and every one of our 465,000 students complete something that matters in our educational commerce. Um, that our students are successful, by that we mean we are very committed to internships and placements for students across all disciplines. FIT is probably the poster child for what we now call Intern Shop, which is an online dating system that matches our students with business, industry, social services, foundations where we place our students, government organizations. Um, I think FIT uh, has about 4,500 students in internships every year. Our hope is that every one of your campuses finds ways to document the placement of your students in applied learning opportunities. Access, completion, we're defining success as what happens after the degree? For many of our students, it's more degrees. But for many other of our students, let's face it, it's a job, a career placement. And how do we track that? And how do we determine that our students are being successful over the course of their careers? Uh, in terms of inquiry, um, of course we mean how much external money do we uh, uh, receive from the federal government or from the state or from philanthropy. But we're also trying to track um, the works of what we call networks of excellence. We have um, seven or eight of these networks of excellence, and one of them is in the arts and humanities. And we have money in that bucket. And we have recently funded about nine collaboratives around the arts and humanities and engaged over 14 of our SUNY campuses in that work. If you know that, you're probably one of the campuses that has benefited from that funding. If you don't know that, we're going to keep funding that bucket of inquiry. So you need to find out where, uh, where the funding is and how you could be a part of it. Um, and furthermore, we also created this year an investment fund to see if we couldn't get our 64 campuses to work more collaboratively on what we call the completion agenda. Right now, SUNY generates 93,000 degree completers a year. And last year, we promised publicly that we would move that number to 160,000 degrees completed every year starting in 2025. But to get to 160,000, 60,000 more than we complete now, we have to start now. So we've been public for a year. And each year thereafter, we're going to document how many more degrees we have awarded. Now, we are very cagey. We didn't say how many more students we've awarded degrees, because students get multiple degrees. So. While it's a big deal to go from 93,000 to 160,000, one of the ways we're going to get there is we're going to count everything. 
we have a new task force on these micro credentials. We're going to legitimize these credentials and count them. So we have money to do that. This, this past year, Governor Cuomo allocated $18 million to a new investment fund for SUNY. We asked for $40 million, and we actually got 18 plus 12. What is that? 30? We had to give 12 to CUNY. Um, did you know there's a kind of unwritten rule that if anybody gets any money between SUNY and CUNY, 60% goes to SUNY and 40% goes to CUNY? Did you know that? Okay, then. Um, <laughs> so we have asked for 18 more million this year. Why? Because we took that 18 million and we went through our existing budgets where the state has given us money for opportunity programs, for distinguished professorships, uh, for other initiatives that help drive completion, remediation. We put all that together, and for the first time in our history, this past year, we had a $100 million investment fund. We announced that investment fund to all of our campuses, and we invited all 64 campuses to submit proposals that would enable more completers. It's just as simple as that. So we had a $100 million pot. We got proposals totaling $480 million. Isn't that interesting? We put $100 million on the table. We got proposals for all but two or three campuses that must have been sleeping under a rock. Can you give me a reason why a campus wouldn't have submitted an idea? Nor can I. But I represent SUNY, so publicly I say all our campuses submit. Because why would I say 61, and I'm looking for those three that didn't, but you wouldn't say that publicly. Um, and we allocated funding based on the degree of collaboration and the goodness of the idea. And if the intervention to get more completers actually had an evidence base. So don't give me just some big idea like you want to create a lounge for veterans if you don't know that creating a lounge for veterans was actually going to help educate more veterans. You got it? We have lived for a hundred years on, here's a new idea, why don't you fund this? You go, do you have any evidence that that idea might work? So we hope to have a second round on this investment fund. And again, this is an opportunity for you to say how the arts and humanities, I tend to think about in, in that uh, context, can advance the student's ability to get to degree completion. And in the day in which many students are majoring and minoring and taking time to uh, step out and do internships and things that contribute to their greater learning, I do see this as an opportunity for you. So the power of SUNY is alive and well. The six big ideas of the power of SUNY are still important to us. We are still investing in them. I gave you an example about SUNY and the vibrant community that still needs work. That's the arts app. I invite you to consider that, to think about it seriously. Uh, I'm telling you that one of the ways we present ourselves nationally is through this annual conference that we deliver in the New York Times Center every October, and I'm thinking you might want to craft an idea uh, that speaks to the uh, digital uh, life of the arts in all of our lives. Um, I'm telling you that we have an investment fund around completion. It doesn't immediately pop into my mind exactly how you could contribute to that investment fund, but it might be through micro-credentials in the arts, and you might want to make sure that you have representation and a voice on this task force on how we're going to translate this whole credentialing phenomenon uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, and. I think uh, in addition to all of that, I do want you to know that 
funding uh, a network of excellence around the arts and humanities is one way I think SUNY can contribute to your growth and welfare. Supporting arts uh, exhibits and showing at SUNY Plaza how important the arts are to us, and Joe Hildreth knows that. We have student exhibits, we have faculty exhibits here at the SUNY Global Center on 55th and Park. We have an exhibit, uh, an extraordinary exhibit of uh, modern art, and it, it's just fabulous. I don't know how often it turns over, but Joe knows. Uh, these are ways that SUNY Central is trying to support your work. We have in Albany a great relationship with the State Art Museum. Uh, where we partner with them, we do exhibits there, we uh, congratulate our best of the best, best of class, Joe, in our exhibitors where we lift them up, bring their parents, let them uh, really enjoy uh, the embrace of, of arts for the state of New York. In Albany, I'm very invested personally in downtown development, and so we have a team of SUNY uh, people at SUNY Central who are helping Albany uh, lift itself up and present itself, and we uh, work with artists and historians to lift up the local art that should be celebrated in the capital region. Of course, it's all over New York City, but most of you live in places like Albany, and there's great opportunity for you to partner with the arts community where you live. This is uh, really, in spite of... Uh, how drawn we are to the state's financial support for SUNY. I believe this is a tremendous time in the life of the State University of New York. I think we have made our case. Uh, budgets are always very competitive, but I do believe that people are embracing the value added of the State University of New York. Um, I travel across the state uh, in preparation for this legislative budget season. We have been in every region of the state. We have met with almost all of the state representatives from the Assembly and the Senate. Uh, the head of the Assembly is a Stony Brook graduate. Um, that is a really good thing. The head of the Senate is a great friend of SUNY's and he has three children and he said that he likes his youngest child best. Have you ever heard a parent say that? You know why he said that? We were there, and he said, that's because my youngest goes to SUNY. <laughs> so coming from the head of the Senate, that's not a bad message. Um, we have lots and lots of friends. We have a lot of friends nationally. Um, the meetings I've been attending nationally, uh, there have been very few systems present, and I really believe that people like the Gates Foundation, the Business Higher Education Forum, look to SUNY as a, a leader we are widely known internationally. Uh, in fact, I think our SUNY brand internationally is actually stronger than our SUNY brand domestically. Very, very interesting. We've done market tests to make that point. So I was recently in Ireland for a convening of systems, and it was 12 countries from around the world, and only one system from the United States, and that was SUNY. Because, you know, around the world, SUNY would be called a ministry, God forbid. You know, that's what other countries do. They have a ministry of higher education. We don't have that. We're much more chaotic. But I think it's important for you to know that SUNY is at that table. So the long and short of it is that you've made me work really hard today. I have my messages, and I'm outside my skill set here except that I want you to know how much I appreciate what you do and how important it is that you take initiative to lift yourselves into the present dialogue. Don't leave that to me. I can do so much in my messaging, but I've tried to give you examples of where the train is moving and where I want you to be a part of the forward momentum of the system. And so, what I said when I looked at these role alike groups and realized that we have like 160 of them, in addition to sharing, collaborating, visiting, lifting up best practice, give me some stuff. Give me some actions that you can take that we can invest in to move the art style forward. I think we're doing a lot, 
but I think it lacks the visibility that it deserves. And I think you need to push us. Tell us. Complain. Everybody else does. Uh, you know, what do you want? And, and maybe we can push back and say, that's a really cool thing. Maybe we can invest in that. And even though, of course, we don't have any money, we never have enough money. It doesn't take that much money to move the spirit. We wanted 40 million. We're a $12 billion enterprise. And with $100 million, we got all this creativity. Isn't that interesting? I've always said as academics, we don't ask for much. Just give me $2,500 so I can hire a student to do a this or that. We've got that kind of money. It's little money, but little money can move big ideas. So as you convene and you close out your sessions today, think really hard about what you can give back to us that we can support and lift up. Uh, may the arts live forever in the State University of New York. Thank you. So um, I might have said half of what I thought I might say, because I never can remember and I won't read my script, but I'll answer anything that someone might have. Through our history, I think you're uh, one of the, I think the only chancellor so far that's come to an, a meeting. And uh, we've had support through the exhibition series, and that's always been wonderful. So um, I just wanted to touch on a couple of things that I know have been uh, uh, talked about in our group in the last couple of years. And, um, and, and one of them that is a reoccurring thing is how do we get SUNY to help shift us from this mentality around STEM to STEAM, which would help on our local campuses with some of the initiatives that happened there. And I was really grateful to hear the Arts and Humanities of Excellence note is continuing because we got sort of conflicting news last week around that. And as a grant recipient, this is good news to me because I know that the little bit of money we were able to get through there, coupled with other money, has led to community projects in six different communities uh, with yeah. over 200 uh, students, SUNY and high school students who I see as potential SUNY totally. students, right? <laughs> totally. And, uh, and so having just seen a sign at the uh, Brooklyn Museum of African Diaspora that said, uh, you know, don't just, uh, if you walk your talk, you don't need to tell anybody you're walking your talk, which I thought was an interesting reminder. Yeah. So, and, but I see that, that in, in the way we speak to things, right, that, that idea of how do we get, how, a, a little thing about putting the arts into that conversation along with all of these other things that people see as money makers or the leading to inventions, we know that there wouldn't have been a machine that scanned your hand to make a glove if, the, if some arts training wasn't involved there. Yeah. Um, so it's how do we get that? How do we get the arts into the language that we're using to describe what I see as a collection of skill sets? And I know, you know, John Maida from RISD started this whole idea of moving from STEM to STEAM. I don't even know if STEAM is the right I don't even know if STEAM is the right word. Um, we've struggled in this group how to get the H for humanities in there, or, you know, and what kind of word would that be? Yeah, so I, so I guess I would turn to you to say how, what can um, SUNY do to get that language out that we can then go on and take you up on these offers, especially for the, the conference. Um, yeah, isn't that cool? That, get that, that language cool. out there. Yeah. I. Uh, I just want to say at the end of your comments, Cynthia, I really do mean it. This conference idea in New York City, in the New York Times Center, is drawing a universe of people. Uh, and it was really started to say, SUNY has a brand. Let's get out there. Let's be thought leaders. Let's be thought leaders. So this is how far ahead we have to go. And I know for a fact 2017 is wide open. 
Uh, so that would require you to go research the previous five conferences, which you wouldn't naturally, it's not a natural act. You wouldn't do it. But at least you see how we frame it. We produce a publication of proceedings through SUNY Press when it's over. It is immense visibility. And it kind of struck me because I had to come here and think of stuff that I could say to you, you know, because you forced me into thinking hard about this. Now, let's go back to, to, to STEM and STEAM. Um, that, of course, was in my notes. Of course it was. And um, I was going to lift up the work that Potsdam has done uh, because that's the only campus I can name that has made a real effort to shout it out. So, see, that's how the world works. Is if, if you could get over the fact that, okay, it started at uh, RISD, is that how we say it? Um, and I didn't know that, but... If Potsdam has a good thing going, why don't you all glom onto that? I mean, except for the fact that it was created at Potsdam. How irritating is that? You know, but that's what we have to get better at. If there's a good idea out there, get over the fact that you didn't think it up. But do it, and do it in some kind of co network uh, collaborative way. So I think... We all glommed on to STEM because that's where the investment was. We know there's a crisis there, but you know, the pendulum swings. In all the business talk that we do, people keep coming back to the kind of people they want to hire. You know, they call it the soft skills, but I think that's the wrong, I think it's the hard skills. The ones around communication. The, the, Alan Alda has this thing at Stony Brook called communicating science. And I said, isn't it supposed to be communication science? No, it's a whole thing about communicating knowledge and using a language that people can understand to explain yourself. And so communication is in the arts and humanities. This is what people want to hire, people who know how to be creative, who know how to problem solve, who know how to work well with others, and who can communicate. It's right in your wheelhouse. So working on the quote unquote soft skills is the way into that business mentality. And I don't have a better word for it than stem to steam, stem to steam. It's okay. I can, you know, sort of halfway remember that. So keep it simple. But if you've got five campuses that are in this STEM to STEAM, embrace it and lift it up. Now, I like these networks of excellence. I don't like how they got formed. And you need to know there's always a backstory. They evolved out of the Research Foundation. And they drew on some money that the campuses generated. But like many good ideas, they didn't have broad ownership when they were created. If you can read through the lines, they popped out of somebody's head, and then we had them. And we used your money to fund them. But we forgot to ask you if we could use your money to fund them. So there's been a little pushback on these networks of excellence because Whose idea was this? You know how this goes. Whose idea was this in the first place? And whose money are we using? Not that they aren't good ideas. So what you may be hearing is a little step back and assess these networks of excellence. Because we said we had a million dollars for each one of these networks. Well, I don't think we really did. Uh, well, uh, maybe in more than just the arts. But uh, well, I, my favorite, personal favorite, was the science of teaching and learning. So I'm an educator, and you're darn right we're going to have a network of excellence on that. Well, they were totally at the end of the line. They didn't get anything. Um, so we are, I think, in fairness, and, and Jen and I will report this to Provost Cartwright, still redesigning. But if we're going to have an investment in an array of specialties, you have to be there. So I think in that sense, it can't just be in the STEM fields, or it can't just be in highly sophisticated, big federal grant buckets. It has to be where we can all participate. So your comments are very well taken. I appreciate it. And I'm resonating with what I think you are saying. But part of the leadership devolves to you. You are a voice. You are an organization. You can say some stuff. 
So don't leave here today without thinking of two or three things you want to say or do. That's my bug with the role of like groups. They come together. Undoubtedly, some part of your conversation is complaining about the lack of respect. I understand that. Um, it's also sharing in a very positive way. I understand that. But in terms of what makes the world go round, it's action. It's doing something. So pick something to do that will advance your cause. And then bring it to us. And let's see if we can find a way to support it. It was a long answer to a very complex question, but OK. Uh, I don't want to get in your way. Yeah, you are. Matthew, you got to use the microphone. <laughs> used to using my professorial voice on the <laughs> But if you hold it, it looks there we go. good. Yes, now I look official. Um, hi, Matthew Friday from SUNY New Paltz. And I just wanted to reiterate um, Cynthia's sincere appreciation for your coming and, and meeting with us. Yeah. And I also wanted to take you up on your, on your challenge to complain a little bit, but also offer some possibilities and, and suggestions and ideas. Um, currently, as I understand it, the um, funding structure for teaching assistantships uh, within SUNY awards 90% of the teaching assistantship funding to the Research One centers. And the remaining 10% is divvied up between the four-year comprehensives. Um, and um, my, my question is in regards to that, because at, at New Paltz, we have a very vital um, studio art program. In fact, historically, the largest. Uh, we have a, a to trumpet New Paltz a little bit, we have the number one metal program in the nation. And I'm wondering if um, we could come up with some ideas of how to uh, further support and grow um, some of these graduate programs that exist at the four-year comprehensive institutions. I also wanted to, to share with you an idea. We're really interested in the STEM to STEAM possibilities, and we have an extremely vital and well-supported um, Center for Advanced Manufacturing and a digital fabrication lab that is a a successful model of, of you know, arts and sciences come together. And we're looking to expand it by offering both you know, potential grad degrees and certificate programs. But without the support of teaching assistantships, we're really limited by the students we can recruit. So this 90-10 distribution, um, is this somebody looking at what we invest, or is this money that comes from the research foundation that you know about, this distribution of funding? What sources are you referencing? So these are um, the, my president and provost telling me that that's the, the allocation of teaching assistantships that we have per, per and, university. And your sense is that is driven by some SUNY-wide um, rule, guideline, right. around the distribution of teaching assistantships. Yeah, and they, they've, they've advocated for changes at SUNY Central level that have been rebuffed, apparently. Oh, yeah, well, um, if there's a problem, be sure to bounce it up to the, the upstairs. I always, you know, bad things roll downhill, and I think that's where the chancellor lives. Not up there, down there. Um, so we'll check that out, because I, I think, by the way, we are recruiting uh, a senior, uh, or a, not senior, but a vice chancellor for research and economic development. Uh, we've had two, three or four terrific candidates. We are very close to making that decision uh, because I don't think we've had a comprehensive review of our role in research investment, research productivity, the relationship between research and economic development, uh, it, examples of your uh, laboratory that's a, a, a great blend of of the science of manufacturing and the science of the arts. So I look for some help. Help is on the way. But in the meantime, uh, we'll talk to Alex uh, Cartwright about this distribution issue. Um, I, in my view, we can't have enough teaching assistants. We can't have enough interns. We can't have enough vitality at, at every degree level. We're just, I guess, short on funds. And, and so we'll check on it. Um, I can uh, follow up with your, who, who's your chair right now? Uh, 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 well, that's at New Pulse. Who's the chair of this organization? Hey, OK. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we, need, we owe you a, a little bit of uh, perspective on that, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then, OK.
Hello, um, my name is Sarah Pasty, and I'm the chair of the Council of Museum and Gallery Directors. Oh, good. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, we're, good. Congratulations! I think this is really yeah, cool. We're, yeah, it, it's really it is very cool actually. And I and first I want to thank you. And this is because last year when we came together, we realized there was one thing we we really wanted to achieve. One one goal we wanted to achieve last year, and that was to bring awareness to all of our museums and galleries through a landing page on the SUNY website. And Elise Newkirk Kotfila in your office made that happen. Good. So good. If it's very exciting to be able to go to a landing page on the SUNY website and see, you know, all of the many wonderful, right. you know, well, groups Elise we have is the and keeper to to that. of the not quite done app idea. Ah. So uh, all roads lead back to her. I think right. she really wanted to get this done. It got complicated. Okay. But it's still just as cool an idea as it ever was. So well, that would f be a nice follow-up to having our yes, our, yes, exactly. Our, our, because our that's what you, page. Yes. you raise awareness, and then you actually give a strategic right. way in which people can actively engage. That would be great. And, and I also want to say that I'm very excited about your saying to us, "Please come to you with ideas," yeah. because in fact, yesterday we heard a really exciting proposal from the New York Foundation for the Arts that is interested in celebrating. New York State's artists who have received grants who come from all of the regions of the state and we are going to be talking later today about how we might put together traveling exhibitions programs, a whole series of exhibitions that would travel over three years around New York State to all of the regions. And so we will be coming to you to see how you might help partner in this because I think it would be just an extraordinary way to celebrate the arts and what they do for communities in New York State through our SUNY campuses. I so, couldn't agree more. Excellent. So, thank you. So Sarah. you'll be hearing and, from and us. And, and thank you for coming to the two of you. No, I'm, thank you I'm for coming today. Here. We really appreciate it. it. it and we're all proud to be members of the SUNY system. You know, I know you are. I know people are. And I meet people all over the world who, even if they haven't gone to SUNY, they name five people they know who have. Or I actually run out of time listening to them because they go on. And then they think of somebody else, my uncle, my brother. My brother. So I know we have a broad reach. I wanted to say something, though, that you triggered. If you um, know much about uh, my background, I am fundamentally a teacher. And I'm very engaged with the relationship between elementary and secondary education and college. And that has actually morphed into early childhood, or should we say birth, how kids come to kindergarten ready to learn, and which there are many measures that tell us most kids, half of the population in this country, is underprepared for kindergarten. And you wonder why we have such low yield at the end when the, the beginning is so bad. Uh, and I have said repeatedly that we have a great role in elementary and secondary education. You prepare the arts teachers who teach in the schools and therein lies the relationship. So now, in the world of New York, we have 60 early college high schools. Uh, and half of them are called Smart Scholars Early College High Schools. The other half are called PTEX, Pathways to Technology Early College High Schools, supported by IBM. You should be in those high schools. Um, the partnerships typically evolve around high schools and community colleges, but there are some four-year institutions that are paying attention. There's money there for that partnership. This is where students in high school enroll in college credits. Increasingly, more high school students are finishing high school with 30 to 60 college credits. If you have children, you may know that they're coming to college as sophomores. Um, I'm not trying to rush the process, but I'm just saying, I bet that's just not on your radar for reasons that uh, most of our comprehensive and doctoral institutions think that's work for community colleges, but I don't. I think that a community college can be a partner, and so can you. If there's one in your neighborhood, then what better way to recruit people to the arts than to live that 3D printing world in a high school. You know, it's just so important to us. And trying to change the mentality of higher education that life begins in grade 13 is just not working for our country. So to the degree you are dipping in to the pipeline in very strategic ways, um, exhibiting in high schools or all the things that you could lift up, that'd be another area like the 
the app. It's a big idea. Get your arms around it and see what you can do. You do need to get somebody on this credentialing task force. I don't know, Jen, who the members are, but I think they're being selected now. And if you're thinking about breaking down degrees into certain credentials or micro-credentials or I think competencies, by the way, competency-based education is at least 30 years old, if not older. Trust me, 10 years from now, we're going to be talking about the integrated curriculum because we will have so parsed our knowledge into competencies that it will break down the ability to holistically view what you know, and we will be back to degrees. But right now, we're in competencies. Enjoy it. Have a blast. Uh, and that's all anybody can talk about. But you need to be there as we talk about that. Yeah, one more. Yeah. We'll share. Thank you for coming today. It's really good to be able to have a chance to talk. So um, this follows up on ideas about educational access. And I wanted just to find out a little bit more um, about your feelings on this. Many of us are getting interested in the campaign to ban the box on the Common App um, that asks whether pr prospective students have a criminal record. Yep, I happen to know that issue. Um, our board is um, contemplating and discussing. Here's the issue. It was, um, I think philosophically, I like to start with, to the degree that your past prohibits your future. Uh, it's not a good thing. So if people make judgments about uh, prior convictions, uh, whatever your criminal record might be, uh, that keep you from redeveloping yourself, um, that's not a good thing. Uh, we would also uh, continue to be very supportive of the governor. Uh, we've had some really extraordinary programs in prison education, and we'd like to have more. You know that he brought this up last year, and everybody went crazy. He brought it up again. Good for him. Let's see where we can go. So checking the box on your criminal record is where that comes from. And CUNY was able to say pretty quickly on, we're going to remove that. They do not have residence halls. It complicates things. It really does. We have a responsibility in both directions to enhance access and to secure safety. So we're struggling. And what I think we've decided to do is to consider not putting it on your application, but when you register, we might need to just know that because of the residential environment of many our, of our campuses. But if you have a better idea, if you want to help us work through the balance between opportunity and safety, which is kind of how I would say it, that is where we are right now. So we need some help on that issue. Uh, and just knowing the spontaneous, well, we just had an incident um, on one of our campuses where a uh, weapon was cited and we had to shelter everybody uh, because, uh, am I close to home? Um, it was plastic, it was a toy, but we couldn't take a chance. So this is a complicated world we live in. Help us out with that one. I, I think you would be, uh, well, you, I could say me, but that would be, but if you write it to me, I do pass it on to the right people. And that helps it move along. So I think I've about worn out my welcome. Um, it just took the invitation, Sarah, Cynthia, thank you, uh, and the calendar. Uh, Tracy, how long have we had this on the calendar? Long time, uh, but that's how it works. And uh, I wish you well, and I hope to hear from you. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. <laughs>